Fridays are awesome. I'm Carl Azus, welcoming you to a brand new edition of CNN 10. Our coverage of news events from around the world begins in Venezuela, where ongoing political and economic turmoil is growing internationally. Here's what we mean. The United States and more than 50 other countries support Juan Guaido. He's Venezuela's opposition leader who declared himself its new temporary president in January. That followed last year's disputed re-election of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and a series of economic and humanitarian problems that are getting worse. China, Iran, Cuba and Russia are among a handful of countries that support President Maduro, who says he was fairly elected and that international assistance isn't needed in Venezuela. Still, he appears to be getting some of that from Russia. Two of its military planes arrived in a South American nation recently. Russia says the deployment is legal and that it doesn't change the balance of power in the region. But U.S. President Donald Trump says, quote, Russia has to get out of Venezuela. Things are heating up on the ground there. Yesterday, Venezuela's government banned Juan Guaido from running for public office for 15 years. That announcement came as Guaido has been pushing for a major protest to try to get President Maduro out of office. So how does Russia factor in? Well, one way is the fact that for years, Russia's been loaning billions of dollars to Venezuela. But the deployment of Russian troops there is troubling countries like the U.S. The Trump administration calls this a reckless escalation. Two Russian planes arrive in Venezuela this week. Their presence confirmed by both countries, downplayed by Russia. The mission, though, a mystery. We do send uh, military planes to this country the same way uh, Americans do all over the world. And it's not a big sensation. Uniformed personnel seem to huddle on the tarmac, although President Nicolas Maduro's communication ministry would not confirm a troop presence to CNN. The fallout, though, has already started. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in a statement that the U.S. will not stand idly by as Russia exacerbates tensions in Venezuela. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov fired back in a phone call Monday with Pompeo, accusing the U.S. of organizing a coup in Venezuela, and one Russian lawmaker seemed to offer an ultimatum. I am definitely against of uh, seeing any country in the world as a place where the United States of America and Russia compete with each other. We have to, to, to do just one single and equal thing, to stay out. And by that, we will have a chance to avoid a direct conflict between the United States of America and Russia. The U.S. and Russia remain dangerously at odds over who's in charge in the oil-rich country. With Russia saying Maduro is the legitimate president. And the U.S. backing opposition leader Juan Guaido. That standoff continues, but the stakes are getting ever higher. Now, Russia's economic influence here has always helped sustain the Maduro government. But now it's increasing military support could become a dangerous flashpoint in America's backyard. Newly released satellite images posted and analyzed by the Israeli satellite and intelligence company ISI show what it claims are Russian S-300 air defense systems being deployed for the first time in Venezuela, presumably on alert for a U.S. military attack. All offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. The defense hardware and troops bring back memories of some of the Soviet presence in communist Cuba during the missile crisis. Do you believe Russia is becoming more and more influential in Venezuela? Former Venezuelan Major General Cleaver Akala, who defected from the Maduro government, worked closely with former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez as he cultivated a closer military relationship with Russia one nurtured and encouraged, he says, by Cuba's Castro-led government. Russia is a great broker, same as Cuba. They have their economic interest in the country. They don't care for the welfare or the protest of the Venezuelan people. Paul Newton, CNN, Caracas. 10 second trivia. What is the only country in the world that currently has an emperor? Sweden, Thailand, Morocco, or Japan? Though the role is mostly symbolic, Japan's emperor is the only person with that title on the planet. The country is officially a parliamentary constitutional monarchy. Japan's decision-making power is in the hands of its elected officials, and the emperor functions mostly as a symbol of the nation. 
But his birthday is a national holiday, and until 2017, he was required to serve in his role until he died. The nation changed the law that year, and now, after 30 years on the throne, Emperor Akihito is preparing to step down on May 1st. He'll become the first Japanese monarch in 200 years to do that. His son, Crown Prince Naruhito, will succeed him as Japan's 126th emperor. And on Monday, a month ahead of the new monarch's appointment, a new era will officially begin in Japan. Eras are what Japan's calendar system are based on, and they carry personal and political importance to many Japanese. Kaz Mastropalo is a football player whose story is both harrowing and amazing. Long before he became a star defensive lineman and running back, years before he earned the prestigious title of Mr. Football for the state of Ohio, Kaz struggled simply to survive in the nation of Haiti. His story is the subject of today's Positive Athlete Report. Nominations for this series can be made at CNN.com slash Positive Athlete. My name is Cass and I'm a student athlete. He is a survivor. You don't really hear about many you know, young people that are from another country and they, they were a child slave. Every day was a dark moment there. Bunch of us had a hard time finding food and whatever we could find mostly came from the trash. A lot of the orphans in Haiti aren't actually orphans. They're either turned over to the orphanage or they come in off the street or they come through the slave market. Cass came in through the slave market. When he was between three and four, he was being sold and a missionary from the United States was walking by. She saw him being auctioned and then took him to the orphanage and he was there for three-ish years. I thought I was going to be in Haiti forever. I had no idea that I was going to be in America. I'm very proud of what he's accomplished. You know, he, he found a passion and he's very dedicated to it. After college, my dream has always been to play in the NFL. Because of those things I had to go through in Haiti, I haven't really like stopped pursuing my goals. I'm headed to Gallaudet University. That's the right fit for my learning and my athletic ability. What Gallaudet is famous for is it is a school for deaf, hard of hearing, as well as hearing. Cass wears two bilateral hearing aids. Just the thought of him next year going to college, that's amazing. From that little boy that came off the plane who was malnourished, you know, he had every excuse to be curled up in the corner in the fetal position feeling sorry for himself, but he never did. For 10 out of 10 today, the comfort of a hotel in a different shape. That's the idea behind Domes Charlevoix, a place where you can stay in Quebec, Canada that gives you a unique view of the snowy landscape. Okay, but why not just camp outdoors? Well, the snow here can top 10 feet and the temperature can drop to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So this hotel could surround you in nature while also surrounding you with warmth. Of course, you're more likely to find chalet than valet parking. And for those prone to cabin fever, a dome could make their head spin, so they may want to Charlotte avoid it. But for travelers who like to stay ahead of the curve and hang around at their dome station, this could fill a Charlotte void, making for a dome right awesome stay that makes them want to circle back. I'm Carla Zeus, and CNN 10 hopes you'll circle back here next Monday.